Thunderstorms can be scary for obvious reasons, but unusual circumstances can heighten the experience. Whether it's the limited visibility or an inability to escape, thunderstorms can amplify the danger of any situation. Here are three scary stories about them and why thunder and lightning can be terrifying and frightening. But real quick, if you're new here, welcome and feel free to introduce yourself. Consider leaving a comment, but also a like and maybe even a subscription if you really like the stories. Now without further ado, let's get to those stories. Story 1. This experience has haunted my existence more or less for the past three years, and because of something that happened just recently, maybe that's why I feel the need to write about it. To this day I have no explanation for it, and I'm afraid there's a small chance it might not end. To set the scene, my wife and I moved into our new house three years ago when she was four months pregnant with our first child. We're both in our 20s and have good jobs, and when we moved in we felt on top of the world. My wife works from home so she didn't have to take a lot of time off, and I work close to where we lived, so that was nice as well. Our extended family, including my parents and my wife's sister, helped us move in, and overall the process went smoothly. That was lucky, because later that weekend there was a huge storm, maybe the biggest there's ever been since we've lived there. It was around 10 o'clock on Sunday night. My wife had already lied down in our bed and was asleep, and I was on our couch in the living room working on my laptop. I had work the next day, so I was planning to lie down on the couch in the near future. The rain had started coming down, though it wasn't a downpour. But the main thing going on was the lightning. It was still far enough away that I couldn't hear thunder, but the flashes were pretty frequent, maybe once every five seconds or so. After shutting down my laptop, I walked over to one of the windows looking out on our backyard, just to take in the view. I even considered bringing a chair over and opening the back door just to take in the experience, but I didn't want to wake my wife up. I am also extremely glad I didn't do that, because what I saw next was beyond terrifying. Before opening the blinds all the way, I lifted just one of them to peek out. When the next lightning strike lit up the backyard, I saw someone. They were wearing a black hoodie and I couldn't see their face, and they were standing motionless about 20 feet away. It seemed like they were looking upwards and slightly away from my line of sight, but I couldn't be sure. I didn't even know if they saw me. For a moment I was frozen, but after that I lowered the blind, my heart beating in my chest. I considered my options. I felt relatively confident in my ability to defend ourselves in our house, and I didn't want to wake my wife up. I could have called the cops then and there, but either I didn't think of that at the time, or thought that he wouldn't still be there when they got there. Instead, I went to find one of the golf clubs in my caddy that was somewhere between the boxes in our foyer. I tried to be quiet, but my hands were shaking. Thirty seconds later I found it and walked back to the window. My heart still racing, I summoned the courage to lift the blinds, but I was again shocked. Whoever that was, was gone. Immediately a few thoughts occurred to me. First, we have a fence, which was locked, so either that person broke the lock or climbed over our fence. Second, since I couldn't see the entire backyard from where I was standing, there was a chance that person was still hiding somewhere. Third, since they had just been standing there and I wasn't sure they saw me, I actually didn't expect them to move. Like before, I contemplated my options. I knew I had to check, that much was obvious. Again, I decided not to wake my wife or call the cops. Instead, I turned on some of the inside lights, and after giving myself a little pep talk, I threw open our door and jumped outside. An important detail is that the outside lights didn't work, and we hadn't had a chance to replace them yet, so I couldn't turn them on. So there I was, standing on my back porch in the rain, with only a moderate amount of light coming from the house and the brief flashes of lightning. I should mention that at this point the rain had picked up a bit. Our backyard wasn't huge, but there were a few bushes, and there were two side yards, one of which led to the locked gate. I decided to check the side yard on the right side of our house first, the one without the gate. I can't tell you the surge of emotions I felt when I rounded the corner, and both the relief and fear when the dim light from my phone showed that that person wasn't there. After that, I walked to the three areas in the main part of our backyard with bushes, but that person wasn't there either. Finally, I summoned the courage to round the last corner. They weren't there either. 
I examined the lock, which didn't seem to have been tampered with. I thought for a moment before going back inside, and panicked a bit when I realized I left the back door unlocked. I hadn't heard it open, so I didn't really expect whoever that was to be inside, but regardless, I locked the door and checked everywhere inside the house. That included quietly opening our bedroom door and tiptoeing around my sleeping wife and checking under our bed. No one was there. I knew I had to check around the entire house, so after turning the front porch lights on and grabbing an umbrella, flashlight, and my keys, I unlocked the back door, stepped outside, and locked it behind me. Now a bit more calmly, I checked everywhere I had before. No one was there. Next, I unlocked the gate and then locked it behind me. I walked all around our front yard. No one was there. I was still just left standing in the rain. Our street was relatively well lit up by a few street lights and the porch lights of some of our neighbors, but I still didn't see anything. A minute later, I went back through our gate and came in through the back door, since I figured it would be quieter than going through our front door. I dried off and sat back down on the couch, and with the terror subsiding, maybe here's where the creepiness factor set in. Basically, did I just imagine that person standing there? I only thought I saw them once, which was through the blinds during a brief round of lightning. They were just standing there, not even looking at anything. How and why did they come into our backyard? My main thought there was that they saw us moving in and figured it might be easier to break in and steal stuff. But still, the longer I thought about it, the less sure I was that what I saw was real. When I somehow finally managed to get to sleep around 2 a.m., I was only like 60% sure it had actually happened. I hadn't wanted to tell my wife, as I knew how upsetting that would be, but I had to, in case whoever that was came back. She reacted exactly how I predicted, and honestly I didn't blame her. She immediately alerted our family, and my parents, who lived nearby, stayed with us that whole next week. I also had a security system installed, and a rather upscale one at that. Additionally, we let the cops know, and though they couldn't really do anything about it, I think it gave my wife some peace of mind. Throughout that whole process, I started to feel silly and doubt myself even more, and at the end of that week, I was only about 30% sure what I saw had been real. Either way, we managed to settle into the neighborhood, and in the coming months met most of our neighbors on the block. They were all very nice. We'd actually met both of our next door neighbors that same weekend we moved in, and we decided to tell them, and only them, about what happened. They were shocked when they found out, and for some reason I felt a need to suggest that I might have just imagined it. They told us emphatically that nothing like that had ever happened in the neighborhood, as far as they knew. I'll cut out a lot of the intervening details, but they don't really matter. Three years later, things were still going well, and we decided to move into a slightly bigger, slightly nicer house in a nearby neighborhood. We love the schools and general feel of our area, so we didn't want to leave it, but my wife is currently pregnant with our second child, and our house was more of a starter home anyway. Now maybe you remember me mentioning that something happened recently, and maybe here's where the situation got even more bizarre. I have no idea if this was all just a big coincidence, but I honestly don't see how it can be. We were moving out in two weeks and putting our stuff into boxes. Our daughter Jess was having a blast and was very excited to explore our new house. I was the one doing most of the heavy lifting, since I was the man and she was, well, pregnant. This was also a very emotional time for her, and I guess for me too, since we had so many beautiful memories even though it had only been three years. It was around 9pm on a Tuesday night, and another storm was rolling in. It had started raining about 30 minutes prior. Jess and my wife were both asleep, and as I'd taken a bit of time off of work, I was just sitting on our couch in the family room, watching a documentary on Netflix. After what had happened, storms always hit differently, and I'd think of that encounter when they did. I'd also always check our windows in the surveillance system, though I'd never seen anything suspicious. Regardless, I went to the room we had been using as a makeshift office and pulled up the camera feed. That was the most terrifying moment of my life. It was a culmination of three years of fear and anticipation being realized at one exact point in time. There, in almost the same exact spot, was a hooded figure. I couldn't be sure if it was the same person, but I had no reason to doubt it. Since I wasn't at the blinds this time, I had the element of cover, so I sat there looking at the monitor, that person wasn't looking at the camera, rather, they seemed to be looking at one of our side yards. 
With both my wife and Jess in the house, I didn't want to risk opening the door and confronting the person if I didn't have to. Who knew if they were armed? Instead, I called 911 and explained the situation, all while keeping my eyes locked on the monitor. In that entire span of time, that person never moved. Five minutes later, and probably right when the lights came into view, the person bolted to the back of our fence, grabbed the top, and pulled himself over. My blood started boiling, as I was determined that we'd catch whoever that was. The police officers came up and knocked on our door, and I let them in and we went directly to our office area and I showed them the live feed, as well as the replay of that person hopping our fence. Though Jess didn't wake up, my wife did, and when she realized what just happened, she screamed. Somehow Jess still didn't wake up. The cops assured us we'd be safe as they called for backup and one of them went outside into our backyard. Ten minutes later, two more cop cars showed up and they canvassed the neighborhood. They even talked to some of our neighbors in the morning, but that person was never found. We've been in our new house for three months, and not a day goes by that I don't think of what happened. I'm sure it's the same for my wife. I don't think I can convey how frustrating it was to almost catch that person, but in a way, the fact that they came back at all and I managed to record them was liberating. Right before that happened, I was down to being about 20% sure what I saw the first time was real, but now I had confirmation. I have many unanswered questions about this whole ordeal, mostly who that person was and why they came into our backyard. Were they really trying to rob us? I can't be sure, but I don't actually think so. Based on the fact they were just standing there, especially for five minutes the second time, I'm almost completely sure they had mental issues. Why just stand there in the rain after all? Did they wait specifically for a storm to sneak into our backyard? But perhaps most chillingly of all is, will they ever come back to our new home? I pray each night that they don't. Story 2 This happened a few years ago, and it still makes me wonder why there are people in this world like the one I ran into. I was going to our local store with my two sons, who I'll call Brandon and Jeff. This was during a thunderstorm, but we needed groceries, so I had to go. My husband had to work late that day or something, so no one could watch the kids. Therefore, I got Brandon and Jeff in the car and took some reusable shopping bags and started driving. Jeff was four and thought it was fun to drive in the rain, but Brandon on the other hand was one and was screaming. I did my best to comfort him while driving, and luckily the store wasn't that far away. When we got there, I opened the umbrella and went around to Brandon's side first. I picked him up and he started to calm down, and then I got Jeff out. Despite my telling him not to, he immediately ran over and jumped in a puddle. I carried the shopping bags with us and we eventually made our way to the store. When we got inside, we walked over to get a shopping cart. Both Jeff and Brandon wanted to ride inside, so thankfully that made things a bit easier. While we were there, I noticed a middle-aged woman having a heated discussion with an employee. Apparently she was asking for an umbrella, but the employee told her that he didn't have one to give. Instead, he told her they had ones she could buy. The woman didn't want to hear that though, and insisted that she should be given an umbrella since she didn't know it was going to start raining heavily. Then another employee walked up and offered to walk her over with an umbrella and help her load her car. But the woman started complaining that she would need the umbrella to unload her car at her house. Apparently this woman just expected to be given an umbrella for free. Both my boys were watching her rather intently, and Jeff started to laugh. Not like an evil laugh, just an innocent kid laugh. But the way that lady snapped her head over and looked at him, and us, was unsettling to say the least. She didn't say anything to us, but instead just glared. I quickly walked away with the cart and focused on getting what we needed so we could drive back and get dinner started. The rest of our shopping trip went about as well as it could have, until we started checking out. While I was unloading the cart, I noticed that same lady still standing with her cart by the entrance. I guess she was trying to wait out the storm. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be letting up for a while, so she'd probably be stuck there. As we finished checking out and made our way back over, the woman actually walked over to us and asked me for our umbrella. I was like, hell no, and kept walking. Who did that lady think she was? Also, couldn't she see that I had two small children and a cart full of groceries of my own? As if this scenario wasn't bizarre already, it escalated to scary when the woman physically reached out and grabbed the side of our cart, 
Instinctively, I grabbed her hand and yanked it away, and my body went in a flight-or-fight mode. The lady didn't do anything else right after that, but just kept glaring at us as we left the store. And of course, there weren't any employees around when this happened. Jeff was asking me why that lady grabbed our cart as I tried to hurry loading them and our groceries into the car. Like I said, it was raining heavily at this point, so that was an ordeal in and of itself. I kept looking at the front of the store in case that lady popped out, but I was totally not expecting it when she actually did. She left her groceries inside and was walking over to us. When she was about 20 feet away, she literally started yelling, saying things like why I wouldn't help her and that she had a chronic medical condition and needed help. I slammed my trunk shut, locked the car, and then got in this lady's face. I told her to F off, and that if she came anywhere near us, I'd tear her a new one. The lady shut up and just stood there. I left the cart and got in my car and started backing up. As we left, that lady was still in our rearview mirror, just watching us. I'll skip over what happened next, but after the kids had eaten dinner, my husband came home and was playing with them in the living room. I was finishing what I needed to do for work the next day, when I thought I heard something coming from our front porch. We'd frequently order things off Amazon, so it wasn't immediately sketched out. I walked over to our door, and my blood ran cold as I saw that same lady through the peephole. She wasn't even knocking. Instead, it looked like she was just trying to pick our lock. I got my husband and explained how the lady I told him about was at our front porch. He immediately got angry and grabbed one of the bars he used for lifting weights. He opened the front door, almost knocking the lady over, and screamed in her face to leave now or that he beat the shit out of her. Finally, she took off running, and I felt a sweet sense of satisfaction. We didn't call the cops or anything, but we never saw her again. I still have no idea who that lady was, or how she followed us home. I guess she either left her groceries or quickly put them in her car and then came after us. Either way, I'm just glad she's now out of our lives forever. Story 3 My family and I live in a neighborhood that backs up to this big woodsy area, with hiking trails, and even abandoned buildings. There's a little stadium with bleachers that I think used to belong to the local school district, but they apparently stopped using it when they built stadiums next to each school. In addition to a few rooms underneath one side of the bleachers and an announcer's box on top, there were a few other shack-like buildings presumably used for maintenance or selling tickets. I'd only walked by it a few times on the trails, but had never gone in closer. For the purposes of this story, I'll call my four-year-old son Brian. Brian had always wanted to explore that place with me, but my wife was never okay with it. Finally, she relented one day, maybe just so he'd stop asking, so he and I left our house around two in the afternoon. This was a Saturday, and we didn't have to be anywhere before having to head back for dinner. There was a storm that was supposed to come in that night, but it didn't factor into our plans since we were thinking we'd avoid it. Instead, the cool air felt very nice, and the overcast sky made for some really nice ambiance. We packed a backpack with water and snacks, and before we left, my wife made sure to tell us to call her if anything happened. The whole way there, Brian was ecstatic, and he was making up stories about what we were going to find. We'd recently watched the Disney movie Moana, so a lot of the stories revolved around that. After 20 minutes or so, the stadium came into view. Brian started running towards it, so I ran with him. I told him to wait when we got close, since there could be wild animals. We started walking around, and it was about what I expected. The paint had all but peeled off, and there was the smell of rotting wood. The glass windows in the rooms under the stadium were shattered, so we didn't go inside because of the broken glass. There was also graffiti, as we were far from the first people to explore this place. As we were walking to one of the shed-type buildings, my wife called. Apparently the storm was coming in a lot sooner, and she ordered us to come back. I pulled up the weather app, and indeed it looked like it was almost upon us. I told Brian we'd have to leave in a few minutes, and he started to protest. I told him it was going to start raining soon, but that we'd come back another day. I also said we could go onto the bleachers and field real quick, and his eyes lit up. I'd been saving that part for last anyway. While most of the stadium was wood, the bleachers were metal and they were rusted. I told Brian to be careful as he started to climb his way to the top of the home side to the announcer's box. I started to have second thoughts about the wood possibly giving way underneath us, but Brian was already at the top and started to tell me something. I asked him to repeat himself, but I still couldn't make out what he was saying, so I carefully made my way up, 
listening to make sure the wood wasn't buckling. When I got to the top and looked in the announcer's box, I saw what he had noticed. The inside of the box was covered in red paint, but it didn't look like the graffiti that had been done with spray paint. Instead, it was covered in what looked to be handwriting. I shined my iPhone light in and could make out a few things like the word death and 666. I'd already felt the first drops falling and I told Brian we needed to go. Then Brian said something that made my blood run cold. He pointed to the bleachers on the other side of the field and asked me who that man was. I almost fell over when I saw a man sitting in the middle of the bleachers, just watching us. The man looked to be about in his 40s, and he was wearing a sun hat, plaid shirt, and blue jeans. He had a beard and glasses on, even though it wasn't particularly sunny. I was also like 95% sure that he hadn't been sitting there a moment ago. Almost before I could react, the man got up and walked down from the bleachers, coming towards us. I told Brian again that we needed to go, and I think he picked up on the urgency of my voice. By the time we got to the bottom of the bleachers, the man was halfway through the field. Just as we were walking to the corner of the bleachers, the man waved and said, Hey there. I froze again, not knowing what to do, and a moment later I raised my own arm and yelled, Hello. The man came closer and introduced himself as Jason. Then he looked up at the sky and told us that a storm was coming. As it was already raining a little bit, I felt that should have been obvious, but apparently he felt the need to announce it. Next, Jason asked if we lived around here. I was not comfortable with that question and was prepared to grab Brian and start running, but for some reason I answered it with, no, just passing through. Then the man said something which I felt was a little bit more reasonable, though I was still very sketched out. He said that he lived nearby and would be willing to drive us back to where we had parked. Jason also told us that he liked to come sit in the bleachers and just admire nature. To be fair, that was something I might consider doing myself, if I didn't have to work and help take care of Brian. On the off chance that Jason was being genuine, I politely declined his offer and told him we'd be alright. Then Jason just stopped and didn't say anything. He was about 20 feet away from us and it was unsettling to say the least. I waved again and told him goodbye as I continued holding Brian's hand and led him away. As we rounded the corner of the bleachers, we couldn't see Jason anymore. However, my stomach hit the floor as I heard a lock or door handle being opened from somewhere else nearby. I gasped when I saw the door to one of the sheds swing open. Whoever was in there didn't come out, at least immediately, but it didn't matter. I picked up Brian and started running back down the trail. It started raining more heavily, and even though the trail was almost entirely on level ground, it was all dirt and getting muddy. I was slipping about every 10 seconds or so, therefore I had to slow down a bit. Every five seconds or so, I'd look behind us, but neither Jason, or whatever his name was, or anyone else would be back there. When we were five minutes from home, I decided to catch my breath. Brian was complaining about the water in his eyes, and also wanted to get the snacks out of the backpack, but I told him in between breaths that we couldn't do that right now. I only planned to stop for about 30 seconds, but even before that, I thought I heard the sound of boots running through the mud. To my horror, Jason and another man came running into view from about 50 feet behind us. I grabbed Brian and full on sprinted. 10 seconds later, I heard Jason say something to the other man, and it sounded like they were running faster. I turned my head to the side slightly and saw that the two men were gaining on us. I told myself that if we could just get back to the street at the trailhead, then maybe someone driving by would see us. When it came into view, I summoned up every ounce of strength in my body and kept running. I ran out onto the side of the street, and when I looked behind me, this time the two men weren't there. I guess they didn't want to follow me out of the forest. I gasped for breath as I slowed my pace, but I didn't put Brian down. We got back to our house a minute later, and while my wife was about to scold us for running inside sopping wet, she quickly picked up on the fact that something was wrong. Of course she flipped out when I told her what happened, and I didn't blame her one bit. She told me to call the cops, and that's exactly what I did, and ten minutes later they showed up at our door. I gave a statement, and they said they'd check out the area. We never saw those men again, but as far as we know, they were never caught. For a couple weeks after that, we were all on edge, and needless to say, this experience still haunts me and my wife to this day. I don't think Brian fully realized what might have happened, and honestly, I think it's better that way. We never went back through the trails by our neighborhood after that.
and instead would go to some of the town's parks, which usually had other families there. But no matter how much time passes, I can't shake the question of what those men's intentions were and what they would have done to us.